My gosh. Sorry about that whole that whole saga of getting the the camera working. I appreciate your patience, guys. Okay, so the the AMA is finally underway. Um, yeah, thank you so much for for waiting, but it seems like everything is good to go. Um, hi, hi, uh, Eva. I've been saying it, Eva. Is that is that the way I should be pronouncing it? For anybody watching this who does not know who that is, um, she's a member of my ARC team for Laertes, which is coming out on Friday. Okay, great, great. So I've been I've been saying it the right way because you just you never know. You know, I don't want to be saying crazy things. All right, well. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am really happy to be doing this. Thank you to those of you who sent in questions about Laertes, um, Hamlet, and uh, indie publishing in general. So I'll go through those, but I'll also be keeping an eye on the chat. So if you have any additional questions that come up, then you can put those um, off to the side and I will check those out. So um, first things, first things first, I guess. Um, I had a question about um, just why, why write a tragedy like this at all? So I guess I'll, I'll start with that. So Laertes, is, as you know, probably if you're here, is a Hamlet retelling set in the 1920s, um, dark academia style. And of course it is very sad because it's based very closely on Hamlet. And um, so I, I was asked why, why write something so sad? And that's, that's fair. There were parts of the book as I was writing it and uh, it was just, it was a little hard to stomach how sad it got at points. And I understood why Shakespeare added some comic relief toward the end. Um, Cause it is, it is very sad. Uh, but there were a few reasons why I wanted to do it, and the most immediate is just how much I love the story of Hamlet, uh, despite how sad it is. There's something really life-affirming in it anyway, which is the original purpose of like classical tragedy. It's meant to be this life-affirming sort of thing, not a life-negating sort of thing. So if you go all the way back to Aristotle and his commentary on the the Greek tragedies, which were kind of the first, you know, the OG tragedies, um, he claimed that the draw was catharsis, which is this purging of pity and fear. So you can watch other people go through all these things, but you can kind of feel affirmed in a way, like purged of those emotions in your own life without having to go through these horrible things. So there is a place for tragedy. Tragic stories are not always my cup of tea. A lot of times I do want the happy ending, but with, um, but with tragedies, no, that's not what you get at all. Um, so that's, that's the first, the first thing. Let me open up my, my questions here and all the hubbub of trying to get the video to actually work. I had to switch browsers and it was a whole, it was a whole thing, but I think we are set here. This is normally what I'm recording on um, for my YouTube videos. So that's why I write down my notes longhand and that sort of thing. All right, so Eva, since you're here, I'm gonna start with your question. Uh, I guess I'll go to your question next is how I should put it. Okay, so who is your favorite character in the original Hamlet play? Who's your least favorite? And do those change in Laertes or do you still have the same favorite or least favorite? When you sent in this question, part of me was very happy and part of me went, oh no, <laughs> I don't know what to say because I, I have such a soft spot for almost every character in, in the play. Um, hi, Summer. And so it, it's not the same favorites and least favorites in the play as it is for my book. In my book, my favorite character is Laertes, is the main character. And my least favorite in my book is, oh, that's kind of, that's kind of tough. Polonius didn't get as much opportunity to be funny in this. Like I tried to put in some stuff, but um 
he's on the list at least of characters who don't who I don't like quite as much as characters in the play I obviously love Larry he's in the play but he's not in the play very much he's only in um oh gosh like four scenes something like that not not too many so it's it's hard to say that I mean Hamlet's a terrible person in general but he's the one that you're with the whole time. He's the one whose words echo in your head. So, I mean, I probably would have to say that he's my favorite in the original Hamlet. And my least favorite... Oh, geez. I don't know. The Player King talks for a very long time about really nothing at all. <laughs> Am I allowed to say him? <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's, I guess, how I would answer that question. I don't know if that was a cop-out or... Or uh, or what? Horatio's grown on me over the years, but he still doesn't make the uh, the list. Uh, you know, the the top, the very very tippy top favorites. Um, let's see. Um, I got a question from Lily, who is another one of my Arc readers, part of the Arc team. Um, she's been great, and she wondered, was Dark Academia part of the original Hamlet? Because I remember she has not read Hamlet, she just read Laertes. Um, and so, you know, to what extent is Dark Academia present in the original? Now, I, I do want to warn you that there are going to be some slight spoilers for the play, at least. I'm going to try to keep the, the book and the way that I do things a little bit of a secret for those who haven't read the whole thing or haven't had the opportunity to, to haven't read it at all. That would be the majority of people since it comes out on on Friday. Um, and I thought it was an interesting question because there are a lot of the seeds of, of dark academia in the original play. It's consistent. It makes some of those dark academia lists. For example, a lot of the allusions that I make to classical works are present in the play. So there is that, that shared academic mental furniture happening in both my book and in the original play Hamlet. So there's that. Um, Hamlet does go to university. He he. It's talked about that he does. He goes with Horatio to Wittenberg University there. Um, but other than that, it has that dark tone. It has a lot of the elements of dark academia, but that wasn't really a thing at the time. So it's also missing some of the the elements of that sort of closed off society of younger people and and uh the the really academic atmosphere it's it's in the background but it's not really in the foreground so uh, it's it's a little it's a little hard to say I, I will say that it was very easy to to kind of lay that transparency of dark academia over what existed um in hamlet already okay um, next up, I had a question from John who, who wanted to focus a little bit more on the indie publishing process. And I got some questions about this, so I'll answer a couple of those. Um, he asked, is it expensive to do indie publishing? And, um, what is the, my favorite thing that I'm looking forward to, uh, this week? So I'll start with the, with the indie publishing thing. It, uh, it depends on how you do it is the short answer. It's not, um, so I do not do my own covers, for example. I do not have this set of skills. Um, that is somebody else that I paid, and it is definitely worth it to pay for a really good cover. So that's where a lot of my budget has historically gone. Um, most people will pay for editing services, and I have in the past as well. And those also can be expensive. Technically, you can publish yourself for no money at all. But a couple, you have to you have to make your own cover. You have to do your own editing. And this is not something that I would recommend for a for almost anyone at all because you want to have a professional product. You don't want to have something that looks like it was just jimmy together on a whim by you know the person down the street. You want it to be something that you're proud of. Um, and you also would have to go exclusive with Amazon. 
and only publish in ebook format. So if you want to publish something to Kindle, you can do it for free. They'll even give you an ISBN, which is the number on the back. You have to pay for those otherwise. Joy, joy, fun, fun. So you can basically spend as much as you want on self-publishing or as little as you want on self-publishing. And I tend to um, err on the side of paying a little bit more for a product that I really can get behind. So that's that's that. I also had a question from somebody else about cover design because I think the cover turned out so nicely. And I won't talk about it for too long, but my cover design service was 100 covers. So just the number is 100covers.com. They have really great services for self-published authors. And as advertised, it's $100 for the ebook cover. And it's more for a print package and, you know, the costs kind of begin to go up. But they have this great deal where you can get half off if you are writing in a series. So I've done that in the past with them and it ends up being ridiculously affordable. It's great. It's fantastic. So um, yeah, I reached out to 100 covers. They have a whole questionnaire that you fill out and you talk about the basic synopsis of your book, some of the major elements or symbols and, and things like that. So they know the sorts of things to put on the cover. And then I just communicated back and forth. Some of the early versions of Laertes looked very piratey. <laughs> They're like a skull and then crossed swords. And I thought, no, let's not, let's not do that. Okay. And then the other part of John's question is the, um, what is the, the favorite thing that I'm looking forward to next? Uh, he said next week, but that was last week, so this week. Um, actually, it's probably my launch party that's happening in Colorado Springs at the Pikes Peak Brewing Logger House. I know not everybody can get to Colorado Springs, but it is just going to be so much fun. It's at this rooftop bar, and I have this flapper dress that I'm going to wear and there will be giveaways and um, I have some family and friends who are going to be there and it should just be a, a really good time. That's happening on Friday, Friday night. So if you are in the area, then definitely stop by. It starts at six and it goes till, um, I don't know, nine or 10 or, you know, whatever it kind of makes sense for it to go. But yeah, cool building. Lots of different food options right there and, and things like that. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Summer. The cover is gorgeous. <laughs> I, like the, I like the 1920s in the back there. Um, I will say that the, the Amazon paperbacks, which are available um, for, for pre-order at the moment, the, the background doesn't show up quite as nicely. It looks a bit more like a black background. All right, all right. Um, next up, we have a question from Amanda, who asks, how, uh, oh, I'm sorry, what, what did you like and what didn't you like about writing a, a POV point of view character that already exists, um, in this case from Shakespeare? I bet there were some challenges. I love this question because it is a very unique challenge to write from the point of view of somebody who, a character that exists already very famously in something. Um, it made some things easier and it made a lot of things harder, but I had so much fun with it that it felt kind of like doing a puzzle when you're on a roll. It might be a gigantic puzzle and you, you figure out that you have, you know, more to do, but, but, um, it was just, it was really fun. So what I, the way that I approached writing a character that already existed is I looked at the original play and I made all these, all these notes about from the perspective of, of writing this book. And I realized all these things that I had to account for. So Laertes, um, let's see, it's gonna get spoilery for a second, just like mute it for 30 seconds if you don't want spoilers. Uh, so Laertes in the play at one point has poison just with him. And at another point, he is backed by this whole mob that is claiming that he should be king next. And it took me a while to figure out, why does he have this poison? Why is this mob backing him up? What circumstances could have actually led to 
that. Um, so it was accounting for a lot of of different things and then kind of fleshing out my own version of the character around what I knew already had to exist and and what he had to say at certain points and what he had to do. So it was, yeah, it was kind of building. Yeah, it was kind of like a puzzle that you that you have somewhat in place and then you build on it around. But it was a really it was a really fun challenge to do to to write from my boy's perspective. It was fun doing first person too. This is the first work that I've done in first person, and I see why people do it. It was a blast. I kind of want to do it again, but it would be difficult with my with my next projects, but I'm not going to talk about those at the moment. Uh, next question is from Kristen. The, there's the age old question. She says of if Hamlet was actually crazy or if he was playing everyone, what do you think? And she adds, I think he was playing everyone and his obsession uh, of justice got away from him. Uh, so famously Hamlet does act insane. He says that he's going to act insane and then he does, but he does it so convincingly that that um, people think that he he actually goes insane. And I actually agree with Kristen on this one. I think he kind of he starts out pretending, but even the decision to try to pretend to be crazy is a little suspect. So I think he's I think he's a Hamlet on the edge and kind of goes in and out the act and and reality kind of blur together there are moments when i i don't think he's himself at all and there are moments when i know that he's fully aware that he's playing people so it it uh it's not a s simple answer it's not like well he's lucid and then he's not it, it's it kind of depends on what the stressors are at the moment and that sort of thing she asked another uh good question about indie publishing as well so what are my favorite marketing methods for indie publishers? And what do you wish you had known now um, than as opposed to when you first started? Those are those are some those are some um, good questions. <laughs> so I'll start with the favorite marketing methods for indie publishers. I'm gonna be super upfront and say I have not found something that works all the time. I'm still uh, that's something that I'm still working on myself and trying to get better at. One thing, I'll, I'll mention two things, two things that seem to work, at least for me. And I know that marketing, it, it's bizarre how something will work for somebody and then someone, an almost identical situation, it won't work for them. So just take this with a grain of salt. But I tend to do well with, um, actual in-person book signings. And a lot of people advise not even to do that because it takes a lot of time. And if you don't sell all the books, then you have to eat the cost and things like that. But I've done signings at Barnes and Noble, for example, that have been, I'm here, right? You can, yes. For a second, the, the internet got a little spotty. It's raining here. I don't know if you can hear the rain sounds, but hopefully everything stays intact. Anyway, so in-person signings, tend to work for me pretty well. And something else, I'll have a handy one. I'll have this for an example at least. Um, I just made these promo bookmarks that have a QR code on the back. This is, this is something else, it's a card for um, like consulting. So if you are a writer and you want um, a, an hour consultation about some of your work then you know qr code there you go <laughs> but the but having a freebie linked to a qr code on the back of a bookmark has been a good way i found even though it's pretty new to get subscribers for my newsletter and interest in my work so yeah yeah you can you can get uh, a book of short stories from me for free if you sign up for my newsletter. It'll come in pieces. If you're already signed up for my newsletter and you've gotten a couple of stories, but not all of them, the rest are on the way. Just, just hang on. Those are, those are coming very soon. 
but yeah, those those two things, having the the freebie and the easily linkable, giftable way of letting people know about that, and then in person events have been have been very good. And what do I wish I'd known when I first started? That's a that's a a tough one because I'm still learning lots of things, and I learned a lot before I came out with my first book, and it's just continued. So I'm trying to think, what do I wish I had known? Let me think. Let me think for a sec. It's my red pony. You can't really see it. It's my Longmire cup. So hello to those just joining us doing an AMA about Laertes and self-publishing. And I'm trying to think of what would be the advice that I would give to my earlier self. And a lot of a lot of the things that I knew going in actually have have been true. Like it's bad to compare with other people's self-publishing journeys. It's not an overnight success thing. It's a marathon, not a sprint. But when you're in the middle of a marathon and people are passing you, you know, it's hard to remember <laughs> that <laughs> I have several books out, not just Laertes, but I have the Tanuit Academy trilogy and uh, and some stuff. And and so I might I might reiterate that advice. I would also say to myself that I should have one name for all of my platforms and my website and <laughs> everything. So people don't have to remember Carly Stevens books on Instagram and English nerd on YouTube and Carly Stevens.com for my website. I would have been more thoughtful about that. So yeah, just add administratively. I would have thought through those things a bit more before, before diving in. I know that's maybe kind of boring, but it would have made things more helpful. All right, next, uh, Rachel asks, how did you choose what era to set the book in? Um, and then what's something cool you learned while doing research that didn't make it into the book? That's right, I was going to actually, uh, I've, I've, I'm going into these questions cold. I glanced at them beforehand, but I didn't actually think them through. And that was one that I was going to, I was going to, maybe I could still grab my Hamlet book and, and leaf through it to remind myself what, cool research didn't make it into the book, but I can easily answer the first part of the question. So we'll do that first. Um, so by the way, if you do have any other questions or, or things that you want me to, uh, address, then definitely put those, put those questions in the, in the chat. Oh, Hey, Kristen, I was, I was wondering if you were, if you were here, I'm glad that, I'm glad that that answer wasn't too rambly for you. All right, so Rachel, if you're out there, how did you choose what era to set the book in? Okay, so to my mind, there were a few different options here. Initially, I started looking at the around 1600, which is when Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. But as I was doing some research, I realized I would have to do a lot of research, and it just wasn't, uh, I don't know, I wanted something a little bit more contemporary. And then when I really settled on the idea of, oh, hey, <clears throat> um, when I settled on the idea of dark academia, then that lent itself to a slightly more modern setting, but not perfectly modern. There were a few reasons why the 20s just started to really click into place. So, so there is, hi, Catalina. There is, the fact that the 20s happened between the two world wars. I don't talk about the world wars in my in my book, but the vibe of coming out of something kind of traumatic, coming out of war, and then about to enter into another one is basically how Hamlet is set up. There was a war before in the play between Norway and Denmark, or at least battles. And then the, there is a big military movement that happens at the end of the play as well. So I thought, well, that's interesting. I also liked the the aesthetic just in general a lot. And I, I liked the the idea of 
1920s Paris, how is that forefront of, of just jazz and a lot of new free thinking, but it was kind of rubbing up against some traditions. And I mean, I know that that could describe a lot of different times, but I, I liked the, that dynamic for this. And then there are a few specific things that made me choose the 20s. Like I realized in in the play Hamlet, Hamlet has some some sexist comments that you cannot you can't explain away. <laughs> and um, one of the things that he accuses women of of doing um, unjustly in this case, because he's talking to Ophelia, who's like not done anything wrong. Is, is that you amble and you lisp and you nickname God's creatures and you 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 have you put on this whole affectation, right? You amble and you lisp, and that was totally a thing in the twenties. You think about like Betty Boop and the silent film stars. There was this sort of childish affectation that was in for women at the time, and and how perfectly fitting those those you know criticisms. Well, no, the, the criticisms are real. The, the reality is what the, the air quotes are for. But how fitting, right? That that would go with with the 20s. So there were a lot of reasons why I decided to choose that. Part of it was just because I wanted to. <laughs> but I had, I had other reasons too. Okay, the thing that I learned while doing research. I learned so much while I was doing research, but I tried to put the coolest things in into the book. But there were definitely... Oh, oh, um, in the to be or not to be soliloquy, and and this I'm I feel like I've already put in a YouTube video already, so I'm sorry if you if you watch that. But uh, in the to be or not to be, it goes to be or not to be. That is the question: whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or uh, oh wait, no, it's going to take too long to get to the line. But anyway, in the middle of the in the middle of the speech. Hamlet says, who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong. And he gives this whole list of reasons why life is difficult for everyone. And, and uh, you know, the, the, you know, to be or not to be, should we, should we die or should we live? The whips and scorns of time. This had never stood out to me as a line that needed further explanation. It's unusual, but it's understandable. It seems to me, the whips and scorns of time. But it turns out that those are actually fencing terms. And I was, uh, knowing what the final scene is, how it is a, a fencing match, I thought, what a cool moment of foreshadowing. And, and throughout the play, there are, there are some words like that that are fencing terms or like falconing or hawking terms that I didn't realize until I was going through through all of this. So there's definitely, there's definitely more that didn't make it into the book, but that's something that pertains to the book, but didn't have a place to, uh, to belong there. All right. And then Catalina is here, I see, which is awesome. Uh, and she had some great questions as well. <clears throat> Sorry about the, the slight spoilers. I've tried to be, I've tried to be good. I'm, I'm very much anti-spoiler, but it's interesting with this situation because some people have not read Hamlet at all. Some people have. Some people in the audience, in the audience today, have read Laertes because they're they're part of the beta reader team or the arc, um, the arc team. So I will I'll do my best to kind of be vague, at least. I mean, we know it's a tragedy, but to what degree and and that sort of thing, we'll just leave that as price. Okay, so Catalina asks, what makes you a fangirl of Hamlet? Do you think it's Shakespeare's best play and why? This is a can of worms and you just went Kachoo! So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say all of my thoughts on this because we'd be here all evening, but I'll try to at least give you some some thoughts on this. So what makes me a fangirl of Hamlet the play? It's a it's a lot of things. There's something there's something about it. I, w I was my initial reaction was to say it's because I read it aloud with my classes every year and it's so fun. It's it's uh, oh okay so I can I can talk about Hamlet then. Catalina just just said um, in the chat if you if you can't see that. 
So spoilers about Laertes. Okay, I can definitely avoid spoilers about the book that is that are separate from spoilers of Hamlet. Okay, good. Anyway, I was going to say that because I read the play with my students and we read it in parts and just have so much fun and I learn more about it every time and they get better at at um, reading Shakespeare along the way and I just find more layers and more themes and we have such great conversations. I mean, that is definitely one of the primary reasons that I'm a fan girl of Hamlet. We watch different versions of it and they get better at analyzing why that does or doesn't work. I mean, it's just so fun. But even before that, when I when I was first exposed to the whole play of Hamlet, it was Kenneth Branagh's four hour long movie. I watched it freshman year of college with some friends, and it just it just resonated so much with me. The words were like music, and I didn't understand. I mean, I understood what was happening. That was not a problem. I understood a lot more later on when I pieced it out and. And all of that, but there was there was something just so beautiful and lyrical about what people were saying, and it was so passionate and raw. And even though it kind of breaks your heart in a lot of different ways, there's something very life affirming about it as well. So it it's like there's the understanding that these people do matter. And they could have taken different, they could have made different choices. It's not just, you know, life is meaningless. It's not, it's not like a modern tragedy that tends to have that sort of thought at the end. It's, it's look at these people who mattered and isn't this the worst. (laughs) And there's, there's something actually really positive about that way of looking at people, even when they do make these terrible decisions. So those are just those are just some things. I, I mean, it's funny. It's sad. It's got it all. It's got it all. And I know that it shouldn't even work. The things like it it shouldn't even work as a play. It, it, and yet it does. But anyway, there I have a whole series on this. If you want to watch it, it's a YouTube series, scene by scene. If you want to hear more of my thoughts on this, then I have time to talk about here. Do I think it's Shakespeare's best play? At this point, I would say yes, just because I know the most about it and my knowledge of his other plays, even the ones that I know pretty well, it just doesn't come close. So I know how brilliant Hamlet is. And so I have to say, I have to say yes, that it's it's his best his best play. It just works on so many levels and it's such a it's such a challenge for for actors but in the best way i mean the emotional range and acting range that hamlet needs to have is absolutely insane it's insane you need to be a comedian you need to be uh, a sword fighter you need to have just the stamina of memorizing and saying more lines than anyone in any of his other plays does it's just it's great okay in relation to shakespeare what do you think makes him stand out from other skilled authors of his time? Is it his themes, his writing, his characters? Um, and then and then uh, she adds, it's quite awesome that he is now regarded as the greatest writer of all time without having had as much education as others. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I've definitely read some other Renaissance writers, but not anywhere near the extent to which I've read Shakespeare. I've read um, Faustus by Christopher Marlowe, who was a contemporary, uh, that's considered his greatest play. And I know about some others. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've read some, I don't feel like I'm all that qualified to compare him to other people of his time, but just taken on his own merits, Shakespeare is so, um, it's, there are so many things. Okay, just just a couple things while while you're all here <laughs> that make Shakespeare so incredible. He appeals to the highest part of you, like the philosophical, the linguistic, the you know, um, I mean, even even political, whatever whatever you consider to be this very cerebral kind of side of you, high class and all of that. 
like people who don't really know Shakespeare think of Shakespeare. You know, it's the the posh, hardly understandable. It, it appeals to that side. But it also appeals to the lowest common denominator, including the, the lowest part of you, the part of you that's like, ooh, sword fights and ghosts and dirty puns, you know? It's... It, he he's got this range of what it means to be human that I have not really seen elsewhere. I've I've seen other writers do some things better than Shakespeare, but largely it's because, uh, for example, Dostoevsky does thinking better, but also Dostoevsky did more than just dialogue. <laughs> like I I I I I don't know. Shakespeare completely flabbergasts um yeah yeah and and it is cool that he didn't have as much education but he just had that observation and 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 a people skills kind of uh, on his own okay um and then I have a last question from Catalina such good such good questions thank you so uh, if you didn't choose Laertes for the retelling, who else would you have chosen and why? This is a, I've, Laertes has been my number one retelling. He's been my ride or die since I even considered doing a retelling. So, um, however, of course I've thought about it. I've taught Hamlet so many times. It's like, at, at this point, I feel like I could, I could almost write another book from a totally different character's perspective and a totally different vibe like set me in the 80s or something and I could still I could still do a Hamlet retelling from whoever's point of view um Hamlet would be interesting uh, I don't really know of that many Hamlet retellings that actually tackle him because it would be really really difficult to do but that could be that could be an interesting challenge just doing it from from Hamlet himself his perspective Gertrude also really confuses me a lot and I feel like there could be a story there in fact I just heard about a retelling like yesterday and it's it's coming out around the same time as Laertes and it's a it's a Gertrude retelling what is it what is it called I'll 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 tell you I'll, I'll share with you all what it's called. I have not read it, so I don't know if it's any good, but I like I like the idea of giving Gertrude a backstory that actually makes sense of her really bizarre behavior. Um, it's called No Life to Breathe. No Life to Breathe, which is a reference to the closet scene. For those of you who know Hamlet, it's Act 3, Scene 4, when... Um, well, terrible things happen in that room, and and Gertrude says, um, "I have no life to breathe." What you have said to me, Hamlet. So I don't know. I don't know, but sounds sounds interesting. Hello, John. So, um, yeah, that would be that would be an interesting challenge. But honestly, um, honestly, anybody. Anybody in Hamlet except maybe Reynaldo. I don't care about Reynaldo. I'm not. I'm not sure why he really is there. But, but uh, yeah, just about anybody. Anybody else. So, so yeah. But Laertes is the one that I that I wanted to to tell because I never saw. I still haven't seen another Laertes retelling. I've discovered that there are actually people like me who think that he's this criminally underrated character. And that's been such a fun part of this process of releasing this book, because I have found people who are totally on board with me uh, in terms of how Laertes needed a, a fair shake. So that was, that, that's been, that's been really a special experience. Everybody getting excited for me. Um, yeah, so are there any any other questions? I'm gonna gonna uh, okay, so no Ophelia retelling, Kristen says that would that would be awesome. I feel like every other retell like two thirds of the retellings out there of Hamlet are from Ophelia's point of view already. So I just I feel like other people are doing it and probably doing it really well. 
I mean, of course I would do it from Ophelia's point of view. I think that would be fantastic. <laughs> but I just, I, I like every, I like everybody so much. <laughs> <sighs> what was I saying? Oh, right. Any uh, any other questions besides why not Ophelia? I do have, for anybody who is interested, a, a bonus chapter for Laertes that you can get right now. It's um, on my website, carly-stevens.com. If you go to books, then it's uh, it's available there. My ARC team already got it for free, but if you are not on my ARC team and you're interested in an Ophelia point of view chapter that takes place before the action of Laertes begins, all the chapters are pretty much months. It's like a school year going by. Um, so the first chapter is August. In Laertes, you'll get July from Ophelia's point of view. If you want to check that out, it's uh, it's there there to see. So welcome those of you who are who are joining us. Are there any last minute questions about Laertes, about Hamlet, about um, indie publishing or anything that I can answer before wrapping up things? I was planning to go for 45 minutes ish and we're getting close to to that time. Sorry again about the the technical difficulties at the beginning, but I got it all figured out. So next time I go live, there will be no such issue like that. Oh, I got another question from Catalina. Ooh, um, have you considered different titles? So yes and no. For the book, it was always it was Laertes in my in my head, and that was the working title, and it's the the official title as well. Uh, Laertes a Hamlet retelling, but I did consider giving the chapters different titles. It was actually a student of mine. A student of mine became obsessed with Hamlet um, after taking my class, and she started writing some fan fiction and gave me a copy of hers. It's sitting right here, but I don't I don't know that I have like, permission to show you what that looks like. And her chapter titles were so clever. They were these these Hamlet phrases, but not the common ones at all. There was no to be or not to be. There was no what a rogue and peasant slave am I. I mean, these were like deep tracks. And I, I respected that so much that I thought, should I do that? Should I do my chapters like that? But then I went, no, 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 no. I'll just stick with the, with the months. It, it made sense with with the, the arc of my story. So, um, so yeah, chapters, yes, book, no. So anything else? Going once, going twice. I'm not seeing anything, so I think I'm just gonna call it there unless something pops up. So yeah, Laertes, the Hamlet retelling comes out um, on Friday. Oh, ooh, wait, we have one more question. I'll just have this be my last, my last question that I answer. Comes out on Friday. You can pre-order it anywhere now, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, even indie bookstores should have the ability to uh, to pre-order that, that for you. But Summer asks, what was my favorite scene to write? No spoilers though, if possible. Okay, okay. Um, I got all excited and then I realized I actually have to answer this question and it's not it's not like all that easy. Let's see, what was my favorite to write? Um I really enjoyed I really enjoyed the the scenes with the with Laertes and his friends just hanging out in Paris. Um, those are some of my, some of my favorite scenes to write actually is, is them and their just bohemian lifestyle. It's, he has these two friends that he lives with 
in a place called the Battlements. And I just really liked spending time in the Battlements where they were in their element and just, you know, doing their work and, and living life. And I know that's, I mean, it's not even a scene from Hamlet. And I loved writing those, the scenes from Hamlet. They were a little bit more technically difficult because I wanted the conversations to go beat for beat as they go in the play. So, um, yeah, probably the most comfortable were the scenes in the battlements with the guys. So that's more than one scene, but I'll just, I'll just leave it at that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, the whole thing was really fun to write. I got, um, I got very, very sad at different points happy at other points. I mean, it's just very, it's a, it's a cozy book that I'm really proud of. And I hope that those of you who haven't read it, um, really enjoy it when you do read the book. So yeah, order your copy. If you want your Ophelia chapter, you can go to my, go to my website. It's all linked, um, below. So thank you so much for joining me. I enjoyed getting all of your questions and uh, even getting some in the moment, that was that was a blast. So um, if you think of anything else, you can always always shoot me an email or, you know, keep up with me on my newsletter because this is not the end. This is not the end of Carly Stevens books. I have I have more in the works, but they're going to be quite different. So. All right. Thanks, guys.